As some of you may have heard, I have been asked to sit on a commission set up by the president to study black men and black boys. I'm looking forward to it. The absence of fathers is the number one social problem in America and by far the number one social problem facing black America. I experienced that. My father wasn't around. I remember um, meeting him one time when I was about 13 years old. Um, and the memory that I have of my father is a memory that I won't share um, because it's, it's kind of a negative memory, but it sticks out. And I know throughout my life, throughout my experiences, I've, I've done, I've said, um, and I've experienced things that I would not have experienced if I had that positive role model as a father in my life. Today, some 70% of black kids are raised without fathers. 50% of Hispanic kids are raised without fathers. 25% of white kids are. Now, back in 1965, when 25% of black kids were raised without fathers, that triggered a booklet written by a man named Daniel Patrick Moynihan, who argued that 25% of black kids raised without fathers were going to have all sorts of unintended consequences. You know, um, I tell people sometimes that, you know, where I am now, I am, I am glad that in a sense that my father wasn't around because in most cases, the, the son ends up um, as a duplicate of the father. And where my father is right now in his life, I thank God that he left because I do not want to be anything like the man that, um, that gave me life. Former President Barack Obama once said, a kid raised without a father is five times more likely to be poor and commit crime, nine times more likely to drop out of school, 20 times more likely to end up in jail. There's no more important ingredient for success. Nothing that would be more important for us reducing violence than strong, stable families. Which means we should do more to promote marriage and encourage fatherhood. You know, don't get me wrong, as the son of a single mom who gave everything she had to raise me with the help of my grandparents, you know, I, I turned out okay. But, no, no, but, but I think it's, you know, so, so we got single moms out here, they're, they're heroic what they're doing, and we are so proud of them. But at the same time, I wish I had had a father who was around and involved. Now the question is whether or not the welfare state has incentivized women to marry the government and allowing men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. Now as a father, I have a purpose. My purpose is to, to be the man, to be the father that's, that's in the house with them encouraging, protecting, providing them, because I know that, that a lot of us men, we make so many mistakes in our life that we would not make if we had that father, that positive father in the house. My father did not know his biological father. My last name, Elder, was the name of some man who was in my dad's life the longest. He said he never met him. Elder was the man who was in my dad's life the longest. His illiterate mother, who didn't work, had a series of boyfriends. My dad said each one was more irresponsible than the other one. One day, my dad comes home at the age of 13 and starts quarreling with his mom's then boyfriend. She sides with the boyfriend, throws my father out of the house. I am not kidding, never to return. You're talking about a 13-year-old black boy, Jim Crow South, Athens, Georgia, at the beginning of the Great Depression. I defy you to find anybody with a hand dealt like that. My father said he went down the road, did whatever he could. Ultimately, he became a Pullman porter on the train. They were the largest private employer of blacks in those days. George Pullman started the Pullman Palace Car Company just after the Civil War. And he became one of the richest and most powerful companies in America. Pullman was a shrewd businessman. He not only built the cars, he also maintained ownership of them and hired the men to provide service to the passengers. 
They used to call the cars hotels on wheels because they were so elegant. And of course, the service was very elegant. The conductors who sold and collected tickets were always white men. But the personal service, which is what really made the Pullman Company famous, was provided by black men. My dad was able to travel all around the country and was amazed when he came to California. It was sunny. People seemed a little less racist. And you could walk in a restaurant in the front door and actually get served. So my father made a mental note that maybe someday he may relocate from the South to California, Pearl Harbor. My dad joined the Marines. I asked him why, and he gave two reasons. I bet you know what they are. He said, number one, they go where the action is, and number two, I love those uniforms. My dad was stationed in the island of Guam during the war. When the bombs fell, he returned to Chattanooga. After all, he had been a staff sergeant in charge of cooking facilities, and he wanted to get him a job as a short order cook. So he goes to restaurant after restaurant after restaurant in Chattanooga where he met and married my mom. And he was told, we don't hire niggers. My dad even offered to work for free just to get a reference. They wouldn't even do that. My dad went to an unemployment office. The lady says, you went through the wrong door. My dad saw colored only. He went through that door to the very same lady who sent him out. She just wanted to make sure he knew what the rules were. My dad came home to my mom and said, this is BS. I'm going to California. I'm going to get me a job as a cook. He comes out here to California, walks around L.A. for a couple of days, and he's told, I'm sorry, you have no references. My dad said, I need references to cook eggs. He even offered to work for free for a reference. They wouldn't even do that. So he was treated the same way in, in, uh, in L.A. They were just a little more polite about it. Went to an unemployment office, this time just one door. And the lady said, I have nothing. My dad said, what time do you open? She said, eight, what time do you close? She said, five. My dad said, I'll be here until you find something. My dad sat basically in that chair for a day and a half. Finally, the lady called him up and she says, I have something. I don't know whether or not you're gonna want it. My dad said, of course I'm gonna want it. What is it? She said, it's a job cleaning toilets at Nabisco brand bread. My dad kept that job for 10 years cleaning toilets at a bread company. Took a second job at another bread company called Barbara Ann Bread where he also cleaned toilets cook for a family two or three times a month to make additional money, and went to night school a couple times a week to finish his GED. The man never slept. That was why he was so cranky, and that's why my brothers and I had such issues with him, because he was such a, in a bad mood so often, because the man was sleep deprived. Not just going day after day, week after week, month after month, but year after year getting insufficient sleep, and then you walk into a house, with three rambunctious boys, how are you going to feel? So as my father was telling me this story, which I, by the way, wrote about in a book called Dear Father, Dear Son, Two Lives, Eight Hours, about this eight-hour conversation, and it was an eight-hour conversation, my dad got bigger and bigger, and Larry got smaller and smaller. And by then, I'm crying, and I apologize to my dad for judging him so harshly. And my dad said, you have nothing to apologize for, you just didn't know but I want you to follow the advice I've always given you and your brothers. Hard work wins. You get out of life what you put into it. And he would always say, Larry, you cannot control the outcome, but you are 100% in control of the effort. And before you complain about what somebody did to you or said to you, he said, go to the nearest mirror, look at it, and ask yourself, how could I have changed the outcome? And finally, my father always told my brothers and me, no matter how hard you work, no matter how good you are, bad things will happen. How you address those bad things will tell your mom and me if we raised a man. Now, my dad was in the garage one day, cleaning the garage. Every now and then he would get this mood where he wants to clean stuff and throw stuff out. So I happened to be over there, and I stopped him before he threw out an envelope, which he hadn't even opened. I said, what's in the envelope? He said, I don't know. It's just been sitting around here. So I thought I'd get rid of it. We opened it. It was a letter he had written to my brother, when my brother was two years old because my dad had a premonition he was going to die at the age of 36. He ended up living to be 95. He was just a bit off. But let me read you the letter. Here's what he said. Kirk, my son, you are now starting out in life, a life that mother and I cannot live for you. So as you journey through life, remember it's yours. So make it a good one. Always try to cheer up the other fellow. Learn to think straight. Analyze things. Be sure you have all the facts before concluding and always spend less than you earn. 
make friends, work hard, and play hard. But most important of all, remember this, the best of friends wear out if you use them. This may sound silly, son, but no matter where you are on the 29th of September, that's my brother's birthday, see that mother gets a little gift if possible, along with a big kiss and a broad smile. When you are out on your own, listen and take advice, but do your own thinking and concluding. Set up a reasonable goal and then be determined to reach it. You can and will. It's up to you, son. Your father, Randolph Elder. Over the years, I have invited on my radio show, Jesse Jackson, he's always declined. Maxine Waters, she's always declined. Louis Farrakhan, he's always declined. But one so-called black leader, did not decline. Kwesi Nfumi, who at the time was president of the NAACP. And when I interviewed him, the first thing I said was this, Mr. Nfumi, as between the presence of white racism or the absence of black fathers, which poses the bigger threat to the black community? Without missing a beat, he said the absence of black fathers. I just want to encourage you guys as, as men, as fitpreneurs, as kings that are out there doing what needs to be done for their family, do what you need to do to stay put. Do what you need to do to stay in, in your, your kid's life because they need us there. They need us there um, protecting, uh, cheerleading, uh, encouraging, um, telling them it's gonna be okay. They need us to be present. And that's the real issue facing America, isn't it? I'm Larry Elder, and we've got a country to save. I'll see you next time.